Hello, feels great to be here. Been such a good conference so far. I'm, re I'm really honored to, to be on this stage. So th thank you for inviting me. Uh, so, back in 1957, a guy named Cyril Northcote Parkinson uh, wrote an article about nuclear power plants and especially like how, how you go by building them. So, uh, it, it turns out that building nuclear power plants is quite a daunting task. It's quite complicated. Uh, but during the process, he describes that the committee designing the nuclear power plant, uh, they kind of notice that this is kind of complicated. So they, they, they try to, like, instead of doing the complicated stuff, they try to focus on more of the problems that everybody can grasp and everybody can have an opinion about, like the bike sheds. So, so they discuss the color of the bike sheds uh, intensively uh, instead of like the, the very important decisions they have to make. So he describes this in his book. Uh, he calls it the Parkinson's Law of Triviality, or as you may have heard of it, uh, bike shedding. So, so, so um, today I hope to, to be able to show you a tool which, which will reduce the amount of bike shedding in your projects when designing APIs. So who am I? Uh, my name is Johannes. I work at a company called, called Confetti, as you heard. Uh, we, we make it easy for people to, to create beautiful event sites, basically. So it's, think of it as an event bright, but you could actually like, have it for your wedding. So, so um, uh, I've been doing this for a while, as you can see uh, of the beard. So, so yeah, uh, that's enough about me, I think. Uh, so a little bit of an agenda. Uh, I know this is the talk before lunch, so I try to not go, go over time and keep it short um, so, so you don't have to stand in the long food lines. Uh, so, so I hope I will show you, we will have time for questions in the end, I hope. Uh, and, and I hope to show you this tool that will end pointless discussion and also like, help you design more f future-proof APIs. And I'll also try to, to show how you can actually do this in your projects now. Uh, so how many of you in here have designed a, a JSON API? And before you raise your hands, uh, I don't mean like the, the just regular JSON API, which can be easily serialized into XML using this fine tool from IBM. No, I mean like an, a JSON API that conforms to the JSON API specification. How many have, have heard of that? Yeah. Some of you. So, so I hope I can, can show you some things you don't know. And for the new ones, I'll, I'll take it from the beginning. Uh, so we're all familiar with the concept of our representational state transfer APIs, or REST APIs, uh, where we use HTTP verbs to, to make uh, things happen at different resources and different URLs, right? So like the naive approach when, when, when you start to design an API, uh, could look something like this. Say we're designing an, an API for events. Like, no reason. Uh, so, so this could be like our endpoint if we want to fetch one event, right? It looks, looks pretty straightforward. We, we make a GET request to events, that's one. We get back some, some JSON. We have an ID, we have a title. Uh, so far, so good, right? Uh, doing pretty sweet. So now we can use this in our, our page, displaying our event. But then suddenly, we may say we want to also like display attendees on this page, right? No problem. We add a new endpoint, like event slash one slash attendees. So it will give us all the attendees for the event. And apparently, for this event, we have Christer Fug Lesang, the very famous Swedish astronaut. Um, so this is, this is really nice. I mean, our app is coming together nicely. But but now, like, we have to make two requests to get all this data, which, yeah, I don't know, could be maybe shortened into one request. So let's do that. We, we add some, some attendees to the original uh, event JSON. Like, it's pretty straightforward, works pretty well. But OK, stuff becomes more complicated, because now we kind of, yeah, we can show the event, we can show the attendees, but we kind of want to show like which other events are these attendees also going to. Like we maybe we want to promote those other events, right? So, so we want to include uh, the event, the attendees for the event, and also the other events that every attendee are going to. And, and somewhere around here, like we get a circular reference case. And, and this is kind of where the discussions start, right? You'll sit in meetings, you'll be 10 people, everybody has an opinion, like how should we handle this case? Now nah, it should be separate endpoints, now we should bring everything uh, 
together, and so on and so forth. You probably have recognized this, right? So, so enter JSON API. So, so the, the 1.0 of this was, was released uh, this spring. Uh, it's been in the works for, for quite some years now. Uh, it originates from Ember Data, the like, um, data framework for, for Ember. So uh, it's, it's, it started with Yehuda Katz and Steve Klabnik, I think, but nowadays it's mostly led by a guy named Dave Gerbhardt, I think. Uh, so, so, yeah, this gives like a specification and approach to how to like solve these cases. So instead of like having these discussions over and over again, you can just like look up how should we solve this case, right? So, so this is an example of if we were to design the same case but would use JSON API instead, it will look something like this. So uh, at the top level, we have uh, a key named data. So data represents like the main thing we get back from this endpoint. So here we do a get to an event with an ID. So we basically expect to get an event back. So that's why we put like the event in the data. Uh, and you can see that the object has a type and an ID. So these two are kind of important because they're, they're like specified. They have to be there. And by using these two, we can always reference uh, an object that we get back from the API. So the combination of these two are always unique. And then we include some attributes. And, and they're namespaced by themselves here. So we have, we have a title, as we had before. So it looks like quite a lot. Like we, we started out with just ID and title, and then we, now we have a lot of stuff here. So, so uh, but bear with me. You'll, you'll see the, the upside soon. So this would, would easily be, be used for, like, if we have, have many events instead, we can just like, put an array. Uh, in the data field instead. So now we can, can, can give back many events. Uh, yeah, but okay, so uh, this, we didn't want to just like look at events. We, we wanted to include the attendees, right? So uh, it turns out, quite easy to do. Uh, we add a key called relationships. So an object can have attributes and it can have relationships. Uh, they cannot have conflicting keys in those two namespaces. They need to be unique per namespace. Uh, so in the relationships here, we see we have a relationship named attendees, right? And again, we see data. So that's kind of the main thing of that relationship. And here we don't have like a full object. We only have type and ID. And if you remember, I said that uh, with type and ID, you can always reference an object you get back from your API. Uh, so in this case, we have a person with ID 5. Makes sense. But I mean, this the, isn't very good. We want to show this to a user. So how do we like, uh, go by doing that? Well, uh, then we have something called included. So if data like, represents the main thing we want to send back, uh, we also have included, which is all the other stuff we just want the client to have. So, so here we can add other stuff we want to send with our, our request. Uh, so in this case, we see a person with ID 5. And I mean, that's pretty good, because that was what we was what was needed in the event. And just as with the event, you can see that this person also has relationship to an event. Apparently, you can only go to one event here. Uh, so here you see again data with, with a pointer back to the event, which we already included in, in the response. So this kind of solves our circular referencing. Pretty great. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There we were. Let that gift sink into you. OK. Uh, so that was kind of basic. Now we want to do more, more interesting stuff with this. So uh, actually, like say, say we start to have like a lot of attendees, for instance. Um, it won't cut it anymore to like just inline them together with the rest of the events. So then JSON API specifies something called links. So, so data is still the main thing we get from a relationship. Like this could be, be the relationships for, for an event with that and these. And now we specify the data still, but we also have links. And we have a link called related. So the related link means uh, where we can get the data related to this entity. So not the entity itself, but the data related to it. So typically in a relationship, that means like the full objects. Like if we go to that URL, 
we would expect to find the full objects for the attendees, the whole person objects. Uh, and this looks kind of, kind of straightforward, but if we think about it now, like we have a specification telling us like, what this related link should mean in a relationship. This means that like, we, we have an API that, that documents itself. Uh, so, so we don't have to, like, I mean, it's still good to have documentation, right? But here we actually have an API describing itself. So this, this idea of this is called like hypermedia APIs. Um, and, and the idea is quite familiar to us who work with the, web, with the web, because this is exactly how a web page work. Like, if you go to your, to your regular like, restaurant web page uh, you, and you want to know the menu, you don't go to like restaurant.com slash menu. You go to the restaurant's homepage, you click the link menu, and you get the menu. Right? So this is the exact same concept. You make the request, you get it back, you can see what can I choose from, and you like, click the link, uh, and you get all the attendees back. So this means like, the computers can actually read our documentation. So that's like one small step closer to singularity, right? Um, and, and also, this means like, the need for API versioning isn't that big anymore. Because if we want to change like, where, how we get the attendees or where we find them, we can just change this URL. Because the clients are going to read this URL, so it will be quite easy for them to just like, use a new URL instead. Exactly as when your restaurant changes out its menu. You go through the restaurant page, and you still click the menu link, and you get the new menu instead of the old menu. So uh, th this is just one link. Um, turns out like if we have lots and lots of attendees, in this case we have 10,000, uh, we can add another link called self. So, so related is supposed to give us the, the whole uh, person objects, but the self link will instead give us just the pointers. So this can be really useful because we, we, maybe we already have all, all the, the uh, persons loaded, all the people loaded in, in our, uh, our app. So we don't need to go fetch them. We only need to know which are they. We can use this link. And here we also added something called meta. So uh, this allows us to specify our own uh, data we want to send, send with this. So for example, the count. So it could be interesting to know how many attendees there are. And, and this isn't something specified. So here you can add your own stuff, uh, which is good because, because, I mean, the client doesn't need to know the count. It's not interesting, interesting for, for an for API client here to know that, but it could be, be interesting for our app to know it. So it makes perfect sense. So pagination. Um, when I see like a new, new web framework or so, or I have, <laughs> have through the years, I, I like to like, see how mature it is by looking at how it handles paging of data. Because that's usually something that comes like a bit in, like it, it's not where you start, like you didn't start to solve paging, you, you do it like when you, when you run into it and you, it becomes more of a problem. And, um, so I, th I thought I'd show you how JSON API um, solves paging and, and their approach. So, so we, we do it with links, obviously. So we add some more links here. So we still have the, the self link, which in this case only points, uh, since this isn't a relationship of any kind, now we're just fetching an event, or fetching a, a multiple events. Um, self will just link back to yourself. Uh, and it makes kind of sense if you think about it, because for the relationships, the self link were just supposed to give us like the same data that should have been there, but that we removed. Uh, so, so, but the interesting links here are these who comes next. So the first link is supposed to give us the first page, the next link, the next page, the prev link gives us the previous page, and the last link will give us the last page. And this is also kind of cool because, uh, and yeah, we have also the meta here, which includes like count, how many we have per page, and current page, and so on, uh, which is like good to know, but you don't have to know them to be able to like look through all the events we have here. So a client can easily do that by, by itself. Like, um, you can just say to the client, how many events do you want? And it could page them until you have that many, right? So, so this is kind of neat, because then you can, like, you can adjust how many events you return and how, how that paging should work, uh, which is pretty cool. Okay, so now we'll look at like reading data, but I thought we also should look at like how do we create, how do we update, how do we delete data. 
Um, and it's, it's pretty straightforward, uh, as you'd think. So uh, when we want to create new stuff, we can just uh, make a, a post to, to the URL, just as we're used to. And as you can see here, JSON API also has its own MIME type. So as soon as you encounter this MIME type, you can be sure that it is a JSON API and that you actually can use it. Because they have a philosophy of um, only add, never remove. So the idea is that you should be able to, an, an older JSON API client should be able to read a newer uh, version of an API. So, so this is also kind of cool because that means you can like start using new features uh, that comes to JSON API that aren't there yet, but will come in future versions, and you can like start putting them in your API without any clients being being affected, uh, and you can like update them as you go. Uh, so, so that's kind of cool. Um, and yeah, and then we just post the data. So this is just a JSON API object, as we all looked at before. Uh, so you just put, put this down, and you expect to get it back. And with updates, uh, you use the patch uh, method. So instead of the put methods, which like many REST APIs use, they use the patch method to indicate that you don't have to like, supply the whole object. You can just supply um, the fields that changed or so. Uh, so yeah. Um, OK, so, so this, this looks nice and all, but you probably already have your APIs, or, or you feel that maybe this approach is like a lot of work to, to put in there. Uh, and, it, and it maybe is more complicated than, than the JSON APIs you're, you're used to work with. So um, uh, I'm not only doing confetti. I'm also, we are also organizing a, a conference in Stockholm called NordicJS. So, uh, when we started Confetti, we, we wanted an event to try out new stuff for. So we kind of created Nordic.js as our dog food, uh, which has been a pretty fun dog food to eat. Uh, so, so we used Nordic.js to like, try out new stuff we want to maybe think that could be relevant for event organizers. And so w when we do that, we want to be able to, to create new apps like or, or we have a lot of, like a lot of services, uh, and we want to be able to like i don't know create an I new iOS app which should like could be able to talk to our API instantly and and like how you would go th go by doing this in the traditional way would maybe be like you have some kind of shared business logic layer with models and and relations between them, but it's kind of difficult if you have like different environments, different languages, and stuff like that so uh, by using JSON API, we've been able to, to instead like, have this self-documenting API, self-describing APIs, uh, and, and build like, smaller apps which talk to our API uh, without having to like, re-implement the whole SDK for our, for our API. So turns out we've been able to like, test stuff out pretty quick and like, do small prototypes uh, by just getting access to all the features in our API instantly instead of like, having to re-implement it. And uh, when we were working on this, we, we started kind of early with this, so uh, there weren't really any good implementations. So we, we wrote our own. So we wrote a library called JSON, uh, because yay. <laughs> and uh, it, it helps you with, with dealing with um, uh, like the, how you use the JSON API data and how you present it. So I thought I was going to show you like, how, how it works. It's pretty straightforward. So, so this is what it could look like. First, you, um, you require, and yeah, this is in CoffeeScript because it looks nicer on slides. Um, <laughs> so, so you require JSON, uh, you create a store, and then you can just like, use whatever you want to go, go fetch your resources. And, and like, I, I discussed this with someone the other day, and, and like, this is over HTTP, but it doesn't have to be. It could be over, over anything, really but like the standards are, are around HTTP, but it doesn't need to be. So, so that's why we kind of let you go fetch your data in any way you want. Um, and then you can just sync it down a store we provide for you. And that's basically all you have to do, because the store can understand the API and understand the relationships between all your data and set it up for you. So after you've done this, you can, you can perform like, you can do find in your store, 
uh, just using the type and the ID you had previously, and you'll get back an, an event here with all the attendees and everything set up for you. Uh, without having any knowledge about the API, we can just instantly do this, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and so we also made a, a thing for this at the server, so you can you can like set up a presenter, um, just tell it the type and like explain how how the relationships fit together, and you can just use it to 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 render stuff. Uh, yeah, so so we also built this to be fully isomorphic, so it runs just as well on your server as in the browser, uh, and this is really useful. Like. For instance, I've been working with a, a React app where we use this a lot to be able to, like, first you serialize the data in your, your server rendering step, um, and then you can just like read it up again in the client uh, and sync it to the store, and you're back up where you were, where you left off. So, uh, and and then you can do like the, the reverse way, and you can go go fetch stuff and sync them sync more stuff to the store. Uh, and, and that really proves a useful use case, because then you don't ever like know what's in the store, but the resource you, you need could be where it will be there, and then you don't need to go fetch it multiple times, because you can just go check in the store if you already have it. So, um, Yeah, so that was kind of the basics. So now I want to show you like, how you can go by doing some more uh, advanced stuff with, with JSON API. Uh, so, so first of all, I don't know how many of you uh, went to Tomek's talk uh, yesterday. Any of you? Yeah, some of you. Uh, because he talked about the JSON patch format. And that's something really interesting. Um, so, so the JSON patch format is, is a way to, to um, instead of specifying, like, this is the data, this is what I want to update, or this is what I want to change, uh, you can instead like specify uh, operations or transformations you want to do in the data. So in this example, we we and uh, oh, you can see here in, in the uh, MIME type as well that we we have an extension. So so this is how JSON API handles uh, when you want to do more complicated stuff. You can make extensions. So they have some like um, defined extensions, and then you can like add your own or suggest custom extensions, basically. Uh, so this is a way to like having a, a small subset of rules to begin with, and then you can like build on with more stuff as you go. So what we do here is we we add a photo. So we specify an operation named add at the at the like default path, uh, and then we just send in the JSON API object. And now the cool thing is if we want to like change the the SRC here, um, we can send another operation called replace. Uh, and we specify the path and the value we want to change it to. So uh, this this is also really cool because because it shows like how they play very well together, JSON patch and JSON API. Uh, and and the JSON patch format, as Tomek uh, talked about yesterday, uh, allows to do pretty cool things. Like you can you can use it to to distribute your data, so you can you can get in sync on the service again, and like. Sometimes, theoretically, you sh could also use this to implement like undo redo functionality. Uh, so, so these together is is kind of powerful because because if you can like use the JSON patch format, you know, you know, change relationships between models, and then you can undo your changes, then it starts to become pretty powerful stuff, right? Uh, so another feature incorporated in, in JSON API is something called sparse field sets. Now, this is a way for you to to specify. Uh, what parts of the data set uh, you, you want back. So if, if we have our event again, we can specify the fields on the event we want the API to return to us. So here we go fetch uh, all events, and we say we want the title, only the title to be included in the attributes. Uh, this can be, can be extended to, to also be able to say, like, OK, so we want to get all the events. We want to include the attendees. And we want the, the events to ha only show the title and the, the person, the attendees, to only show the name. So this is quite similar. I don't know, how many of you are familiar with GraphQL? Yeah, some of you? OK. So GraphQL is, is like Facebook's new old thing. They've been using it for some time, but they haven't made it like public until recently. Uh, this is what they use, and they, they released a new framework 
uh, I think not very long ago, called Relay, uh, which is supposed to be like the MVC framework for React, basically. And, and there, they, they use GraphQL pretty heavy. So, uh, so like, the difference between their approach, which is basically, because this is like the same question we, we make here, basically. We say we want to include attendees, and we want the field title and name. So that's kind of the GraphQL for do doing so. And GraphQL focuses a lot on asking like intelligent questions to your API, like really define and detail what you want the API to return. Whereas JSON API is, is in my opinion, more focused on, on returning like intelligent answers from your API. So, so that's kind of two different approaches. Um, it will be interesting to see like where one fits better. Um, but I definitely think like it's harder to ma maybe make a GraphQL implementation than a JSON API implementation. So, in my opinion, like JSON API is more lightweight. I can see more use for it. But I'm sure like GraphQL is, is great for Facebook, for instance. So another feature we have in in JSON API, which I think is kind of cool, is is like we can we can make responses from our server, which doesn't have to be the same all the time. Uh, so. Like what that means is basically, so I, ha I have like a stupid example here. So, so say we have, uh, we go fetch a page with like standard Chrome. Then maybe the server says, okay, here you, get, here you go, you get 20 events, and here I side, side load some data, which I think you, you will find useful. Um, and that's good and all, but what if we like, maybe think that, but for, for I don't know, for if, if you come with your phone, for instance, then maybe we only want to return like five events or something because we don't want to like push too much data down, down your throat, um, and and yeah, as you remember, then we can just like with links instead specify where you can get more more data, and I think this is kind of interesting because like instead of asking like tricky clever questions from your client, you let the server be in be in charge of who gets what. And that means that you don't have to, like, for instance, update all your apps when you want to change how they, they ask for data, because you can do that from the server. Because if, if they say the, the mobile app says, but I know I want, I want 10 events, then they will probably have to page this once. And then you can see from the server like, how the apps behave. So, so, and this could be extended. I mean, this is just a stupid example of how you use a user agent flag to do this. But you could like, go um, and give, like, uh, different users, different data back, depending on how they use your app. So you can see that if some users always use some resources, or, or you could try to like um, predict which, use, which resources uh, will be important to them, and you can like preload the app with those resources as soon as they log in. Uh, so, so I think this is kind of the, the really interesting parts of, of this, this method. Like, you, you get all these bonuses, which suddenly opens up for making like new stuff you couldn't do previously in, in APIs. Um, yeah, so I thought I'd show you one more example of, of how you can do error handling. So, so error handling is another, in my opinion, like another pain point for, for API design. This is really where you, you start off by, oh, we can just like use status HTTP status codes for this. And like, oh, no, it doesn't cut it. And then you have to like internationalize them and so on and so forth. So instead of trying to reinvent the wheel and like have to discover all these like issues with error handling, uh, they give you a pretty like robust way of handling errors. So um, this is how an, an error could look like in JSON API. So you have uh, uh, the HTTP error codes, as you've seen before, uh, the, the MIME type. And, and they also like embed the status code in each error. So, and they give a pointer to your data. Um, and this is, this is actually called uh, a JSON pointer, I think, which is an RFC. Uh, and you give like a title of the error and the detail of the error. And this can, can be extended. Like you can easily uh, give back lots of errors. Um, for for the user, like if they have made multiple errors, and also like this supports codes and stuff, so you can internationalize them and and so on. Yeah, and of course, uh, JSON API is is uh, filled with a lot of more stuff. Uh, so I thought I'd uh, go to 
uh, questions here and see if we have any before I summarize. And, and oh, I have some merch here for you. So for the first question askers, uh, I'll give you, you have some Nordic.js merch here. So yeah, there's a couple bags and some stickers and things like that. So I think the first question's right on the left there for of Luca. And we got another one back here. Samo, radio mikro. Thanks uh, for the merch. Uh, what's the difference? Uh, I don't know if you uh, took notice of it uh, between all data and JSON API. Between all all data. All all data. O O D A T A. O D data. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not aware. Like, could you? It's basically all data is uh, uh, is a implementation of REST, pretty similar to this actually, where you mm -hmm. can uh, query. Well, basically, you can query database over over the uh, uh, JSON API, uh, REST uh, API. Mm -hmm. so, so, so I don't know. I don't know that implementation specifically, but I know that there are like lots of difference, and and I've looked at some of them, and and what I find is usually like they're trying to. I think, in my opinion, then they try to solve too much, like because I, I think like the usual problem when you try to like suggest suggest at your company that you you should use something like this, and you come with a like, gigantic standard, uh, you'll, you'll meet some, yeah, people will get kind of frustrated, and you will have a hard time to, to like, ship it in. So for instance, like, a lot of these standards like, tries to support uh, mm, like, static types in JSON, for instance. And then suddenly, you, you like, end up in, in I, I mean, because we started off with like the really simple case, and we added stuff to that. And if you were to supposed to be adding more and more craft to it, then then people would instantly say like, no, no, this is too complicated. We'll make our own. So I think like one of the biggest strengths with with uh, JSON API is that it's so lightweight. It's it's a specification. It's kind of small, but it still solves um, a lot of the cases, and it has like a, a big option for extending it and add add more stuff to it. So. Uh, just to extend on it, uh, what about the support on the back end for, for the API? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? I mean, is it complicated? Do we have some kind of library uh, that you connects to, uh, to the uh, database or something like that? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, I'll, I'll go back a few slides. So, so basically, this is how we do it in, in our back end. So we, we create these presenters using our, our JSON library. So, and this is basically all we need. Because then we have like an adapter. We, we support some ORMs uh, in, in Node, so we use one called SQLize, for instance. Uh, I don't know, but it, but it's it's quite easy to make a new adapter to to do that. And and then it can like by itself by like just looking at our models, uh, make this is just like a short example. It's quite easy if you want to like because we we also use this to to control like which attributes should who get. So we use this to, for instance, as a user log it in then, and, the, and the user owns the event. Then we want to present some data from, from an event, for instance. But if, if the user is not logged in, if it's just supposed to, that, like somebody who want to know more about the event, basically, uh, then we want to sh expose much less of the event. So then we can control this in these presenters. But like this is the base case, how you would only like implement the smallest possible. Um, and then you just have to like put presenters together, and they, they will do the work for you, basically. OK, we have another question over here. Uh, hey, uh, he asked uh, one of my uh, last ones, which was, what libraries are you using? So I guess you're using Node. Uh, yeah, for this. yeah we're, we're doing this in Node. OK. Uh, um, I had another question of, you, so, you showed paging um, previous and next. Mm -hmm. Do you? Um, does JSON, does that support uh, page numbers and specific page numbers and counts? Uh, is that in the JSON API specification? Uh, so not by default. I, I know there are extensions trying, trying to like add that to it. But in, in the, like, if we move back to the paging stuff here. Yeah, so this is kind of what they give you uh, by default, right? But but then there are I think there are extensions which you can use to like even specify more stuff around paging, but like this is again it's supposed to be like this this minimal thing that you can like use to yeah solve okay. the most basic cases. And whenever you uh, make the request for the user, you gave the example of of a logged in user. Mm -hmm. I know Ember Data. Uh, whenever you do a get, um, 
they have now a special function to show whether you should get more data, but how do you handle caching? So if you got the user already, but now they're supposed to maybe see a little bit more information, how do you know whether you should re-request it and um, maybe request more parameters about that user? Mm -hmm. so, so basically, the, the uh, JSON API specification doesn't like solve that for you. But I guess it would be quite easy to do just by like, adding versions to, to your objects if you wanted to. Like if this is, is important for you and you have, have no other way, or I mean, you could do it so with timestamps just as well, uh, or e-tags probably. Um, so I, I guess you would just go by solving that by, by using like the usual cache techniques you would use in, in any API, um, I guess. Okay, one more question up front here. Okay, sorry. Uh, just one more question. Mm -hmm. Do, uh, does the API have any, any kind of uh, authentication built in support for authentication? I mean, because this presented all about the models and so on. Yeah. So, so yes and no. Uh, we use it with just like uh, HTTP authentication, like, like you would do normally. So, so yes, by like conforming to HTTP, it, it does have that. But, but again, I think like the... I think it's kind of good that it doesn't have their own way of saying how you should solve authentication because depending on like how, yeah, they talk a lot about using it over HTTP, but you're, you don't have to. Uh, so depending on like which transport pro protocol or layer you use, I think different authentication methods make sense, basically. So there was a question there? I think we have just one more. Okay. Yeah, okay, so one last question. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so what's the, do you know what's the client uh, adoption and uh, how does, uh, does it work in static uh, clients like Android and Java? Because of the dynamicity, it seems like the uh, mapped objects in Java would be full of nulls or stuff like that, which mm -hmm. are... Um, yeah, so, so I, I get back to that. Um, I, I have a, I think I have a slide. Um, about the adoption, uh, but but yeah, that's it's there are quite a lot of clients basically uh, that solves this in, in different different ways. Uh, so yeah, uh, just a quick summary, and I'll get back to your question. So, in my opinion, this gives you uh, a very good future-proof strategy for for designing your APIs, and I think it's something you should like uh, think of adopting. Uh, it's. For us, it has been a great help to like end, end a lot of pointless discussions around how you should solve these pretty basic cases in your API designs. Um, and yeah, I want you to try out JSON and ask your question, like, how are the adoption? It's like more than I could fit on a slide. So I guess we have like Java down here. Uh, for instance, you have .NET here. So it's, it, the adoption is, is quite good for this. Uh, and, and this is kind of the a very important thing, I think, because this means like you can you can go and and try it out in in a whole different environment, and so so this comes back to this sharing of business logic. It's quite easy to to just like start your Android app, for instance, and you, then just hook it up to your API, uh, and then use one library at the server and another at the client, and you could like just follow the JSON API updates, and you'll have this uh, by by using the never remove only add strategy. So here are some useful links. Uh, a link to JSON API. Uh, there's JSON, our library, uh, Ember Data, the original implementation. Uh, Puppet.js, which Tomek showed yesterday, is a, a really good way of doing uh, the JSON patch stuff. Uh, and then also we have uh, Orbit, which is, which is a project also handling like JSON patch and, and, and a try to, to make that work really well. Uh, and lastly, uh, I will kindly ask you to go to this link. Uh, there are some, some of th there you can find the slides to talk. Uh, you can give me some feedback how, on how I could improve. So I would very much uh, like you to do that. Yeah, seem to work. Good. So I'll not uphold you anymore. Uh, time for lunch. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. <laughs>